OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Hello everyone, I'm Melinda Holt. I'm a project specialist for OTAN, the Outreach and Technical Assistance Network, and I will be your host for this OTAN Tech Talk. The title for this OTT is Guiding You Through the Digital Guidance. Our presenter today is Francisco Pinedo, an OTAN trainer, and let's get started. Francisco? Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, once again, my name is Francisco Pinedo, uh, subject matter expert uh, here for uh, OTAN. A little bit about me, again, as I just mentioned, I'm an OTAN uh, subject matter expert. I'm also the lead instructor for Solidad Adult School, and I'm also a contributor to the guidance document. So that's going to be what we will be uh, uh, discussing in this video, the guidance document. So it's not just a random person that's going to present, but it's actually somebody who did contribute to this uh, guidance document. My objective is for you to go into the OTAN website and get the guidance document. So that's going to be my main objective that um, I'll be uh, pre presenting in. So what is the guidance document? So the guidance document is a resource for adult education staff and administrators to look and to see how can I use it in my agency. Uh, also, it could be a resource for your local uh, CAPE consortium, which is what we are using it with in my local consortium. I uh, just want to make uh, clear to let you know that this is not a set of standards for teachers to remember. That's a question that I have been getting asked a lot. Is this a new set of standards in adult education? No, the guidance document does talk about standards. For example, the ISTE standards, the International Society for Technology Education. It also talks about the uh, CASAS competencies. It talks about adult education standards. So this document does talk a lot about standards, but this is not a new set of standards, but it's a document that includes all the standards in adult education. So just want to make sure that's clear because people have asked me, um, you know, is this something new? Uh, it is also uh, not how for it, it's not how for your agency um, to do things, but it's rather a framework that you are going to be building over time. So the key word here is over time, you know, once your agency and your agency, you get this document and you disseminate it, it's a framework for you to be building it over time, not meaning, you know, it's going to happen this school year, but it's something that you could start incorporating this school year and next school year and building upon. Uh, the guidance is not meant to be done by one teacher or one administrator, but rather by a collaboration of admin teacher and staff. And I would also say students, you know, students are the ones who are going to be benefiting from this. So why not invite them to the table as well? Uh, the guidance will benefit, as I mentioned, your students, thus increasing student retention. So we have seen since we've been using uh, more different types of learning models that student retention is on the increase in some of the uh, some of our local programs. So where can I get the guidance? So if you visit the O10 website, on the upper right-hand uh, corner of the screen or section of the screen is going to be the link to the guidance document. So right here, you would be able to go onto the O10 website. And then on the upper right-hand corner, uh, there will uh, be an area where you can download the document do that. And then you will be able to have this living document. So this is a living document, means it's changing uh, constantly. So it's not that it's just published and done, but it's, it is going to be updated quite regularly as new information comes along. So if we look at digital learning, the big picture, so we have equitable access, meaning the students have access to different sorts of technology, uh, more so than a four inch screen, because we know it's very difficult to function on a four inch screen, like a smartphone screen, uh, but that the student has equitable access to uh, different sorts of technology, whether it's like a tablet, it's a laptop, Chromebook, or a desktop computer. Also, when we talk about digital learning, we're talking about appropriate content. 
content that is um, culturally sensitive to our students, but also at the same time is appropriate for the students. It's not going to be something that is um, like cartoon based or geared for elementary, but it's geared for adults with a cultural uh, sensitivity. And also, and most importantly, I would say is prepared teachers. It's having teachers uh, in enough professional development, having them, giving them the access to PD at the, your district level, consortium level, and also a different available uh, at the state level as well, like OTAN, like CCA, and other agents like CalPro as well, uh, to prepare the teachers. So then that way we that way we have uh, all of these three components: equitable access, appropriate content, prepared teachers, and that's going to add to equal to happy students, a happy school where learning will happen both digitally and in person as well. If we look at the digital guidance, it does have seven chapters. It has the introduction where it's going to be giving you a brief history of adult education. You know, it's always important to know where we come from to understand where we are to lead us into what is coming next. Uh, chapter two is talking about ensuring equity and access, uh, mainly talking about devices, connectivity, understanding the learner's uh, needs and accessibility, also talking about universal design, uh, which is you know, very important. You know, there's um, other information that you could find you know, on the OTAN side of you about universal design. Uh, it, chapter three talks about the foundations of adult education and digital uh, learning. So here's where it's going to be talking about the different theories, the different standards that I mentioned previously. Uh, it's also going to be talking about professional development. Chapter four, designing flexible learning experience. So here we're going to be, you will be reading about blended learning, digital learning, OERs, the open education resource, and how to evaluate that content uh, and tools to evaluate that content. Chapter five is talking about adapting models that work. So different digital learning models, planning, reporting as well. Uh, chapter six is data-driven instruction by a, and digital assessment. So we all know uh, in our programs, we do a lot of uh, data-driven instruction. So here it's gonna say how to use this data to help your students succeed. Uh, chapter seven, fostering uh, healthy, equitable and inclusive digital communities is community building. Um, and also digital citizenship, which is you know something that I emphasize over and over is having those digital uh, citizenship skills and also having um, digital access to your uh, students, plus a comprehensive literature review, glossary, and executive summary. Uh, in the guidance document also includes videos from different teachers uh, in different agencies throughout California and also includes uh, teachers and administrators and kind of like their testimony on how they are using digital learning in their programs. So I invite you to please download the digital document and visit on it uh, frequently because the information will be changing. So I will be talking to you about how we use the digital guidance in our consortium. So for example, here in our Salinas Valley Adult Education Consortium, we do have a PD design for uh, and dedicated to high flex and hybrid instruction. So the digital guidance, we use it to see how can we as a consortium better help our agencies that we um, in our consortium uh, to how we could better our instruction both for high flex and for hybrid uh, learning and also you know re remote learning. Some programs are 100% remote. Uh, some programs are, are in person and you know that sweet spot in the middle is having both students in person and online at the same time and how are we going to do that uh, so that really has helped agencies uh, like Salinas Adult School like Soledad Adult School and other adult schools here in our consortium to start looking into we could serve more students because we'll have them in the classroom we'll have them outside of the classroom thus it will help our retention and we'll also build our numbers which is something that a lot of agencies are interested in. 
Uh, we are also looking at open education resources used in pathway programs. So in our pathway programs, a lot of the pathway programs that we have in our consortium are using OERs at the adult school and also with our local community college. So this is great because a student no longer has to purchase a textbook that is fairly expensive, but they can use OER uh, books that are available uh, because in our consortium, we've talked about the importance of OER and also in the, our local community college is using OERs. Uh, providing our students with access to technology include devices, internet access and digital literacy skills. So in our consortium, we really have been looking a lot is how can we provide our students these devices needed to be successful. The internet access, which we know that now in a national initiative is going to be addressing that issue. And also how can we uh, teach digital literacy skills? So that was one of the things that in our consortium is really important and making sure that all of our students have at least access to some devices, whether if it's loaned out or they could use it extended hours during our programs that we operate. Uh, also the internet and providing those digital literacy skills, which I highlight and I always say are very important to make this guidance document work and to helping your students be those happy students I showed you the slides before. We need those digital literacy skills. So using the local guidance at the local school level for the students, uh, the students always, as they come in our program, they do the student technology intake form, which is uh, what they do. And I'll visit that form. Uh, you could visit that form. And then right there, it's on the uh, Cal Adult Org site. And it's the student intake form where it asks the student, what type of technology do they have? What type of technology do they use? Um, so that one right there, we use it to see visually see what is it that our students are lacking, what skills they're lacking, and what skills they know. And we kind of build from there. So every quarter, every semester, we look at the results. And then we also look at previous year results. And we're able to see, OK, students are having a hard time accessing, for example, their email. Or students don't know how to uh, respond to, to an email or things like that. And then we're able to address those little gaps within each school. I mean, each school site is very different. Uh, and then we determine what barriers students face in technology. We also use local nonprofits uh, to help students get devices. Uh, here locally, there is an organization, Lowe's Fishes and Computers, based in Salinas. And I know there's many more out in the state of California that, and, and beyond that do offer students help getting devices based on, you know, different um, different parameters. Like if the student is in free lunch, uh, you know, K-12 students, if... Um, for example, they would qualify to get a low uh, low cost uh, computer or that they could keep. Also, it provides them with help to getting access to internet, having access to, and then this organization also offers digital literacy uh, programs online, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, we also offer students help with signing up for the affordable connectivity program at our school site. Uh, so right here, the students could go uh, get help signing up for this program where it will give them a $30 to up to $50 credit every month on uh, broadband internet. Uh, we also loan devices to students. So these were devices that were purchased a few years ago. So we do have a program where we loan out uh, devices. We would also be doing hotspots in the past few years. We, uh, in the last year, we haven't done that. But in some agencies, I know they are doing that. They're loaning out a device and also a um, hotspot. That way it will help the learner be able to learn uh, using different platforms that are used in the classroom. Also incorporating digital literacy in every program. And again, that's something that I do stress a lot. Not only is it for ESL, but it's also for your CTE programs. It's also for our HSC program, our HSD program. So in every program here, we are incorporating digital literacy skills. Uh, literacy skills. For example, we're transitioning from paper-based testing to more having computer-based testing. So that means that in our HSC program, we are having students do typing skills, how to uh, use the mouse, how to 
uh, type when you have a little timer on so that way they won't get distracted when they're taking the HSC exam and they see that little clock. So doing all this in your classroom is going to prepare your students to be more successful when they take, for example, the HSC uh, exam. Also in our CTE programs, all of the CTE programs that are offered here in our consortium use technology to some extent, especially like in the medical field. So teaching the students how to uh, capture data, how to read data, how to incorporate data into a, a, a spreadsheet, for example, or how to use and, and types of programs. So that is something that is used as well in our consortium. So in every aspect, even in our ESL, our very low beginning uh, literacy ESL program, heavy on technology. But with that, it also includes having the teachers having that training on how to teach the students to use technology. So in our school, we do have a lead, um, a lead instructor who helps the teacher uh, with students to have, uh, like teach them how to use basic literacy skills. Uh, we also refer them to, like I mentioned before, our local nonprofits that might have more with digital literacy or even partnering adult schools that they have events in our local community college also has events for uh, students with uh, digi low li digital literacy skills. So in our consortium and in our school, we are always looking for those resources to help the student be uh, successful. So using the guidance document at the local school level for teachers, the teachers again use the teacher technology intake survey. And with this one again, we see uh, what are some of the areas that the teacher is proficient in and what are some of the areas that the teacher is uh, lacking skills in. And then we kind of build a PD around that. We also offer continuous PD for staff on using technology. And our district has also invited us in the past for their technology uh, PD days, which are usually held before school starts before school returns from spring break and sometimes during the summer. So they always invite us to be part of these uh, trainings. We're also uh, always get invited from other local uh, community uh, colleges and adult schools. Uh, also developing mini tech team to mentor your teachers. So some agencies I know are small, so that might be difficult, but maybe having that one or two people at each site who is going to mentor teachers on how to use technology. Uh, also allow teacher input when selecting the technology. I've noticed that in the past, when I tell my staff, you know, we want to use this curriculum or this curriculum, what do you think? They actually give me input because they're the ones who are going to be using it. So, using it. so when I allow my teacher input when selecting technology, one, they're more likely to use it, and two, they're gonna feel like they had a say in it. So they're going to use it actually more because they had a say in it. Uh, also continue loaning out devices to students and have drop-in technology hours. So since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, we have had a Friday, every Friday where we have drop-in hours for students to come in if they can access Canvas, since we do use uh, Canvas for our ESL program, if they are having trouble connecting to their high school uh, diploma uh, program that they were using. So it's uh, having that drop-in technology for students to come into our school and get that help that they need. Because one of the biggest barriers besides um, having access, access to a device is for the students not knowing how to use the different programs that are being used in each of our programs. Uh, we're in our learning management system. So for example, that one did prove to be a little bit more hard. Uh, so we would set time aside for the students to onboard them if they came in later during the program. And that onboarding included about an hour or more of a teacher helping the student how to connect to Canvas, how to uh, register in Canvas, and how to navigate the coursework in Canvas. So having that time invested does really make a difference because one, it will keep the student in the program, and two, that one or two hour of investment will help the student succeed. Thus, the student will also help you students who come into the classroom and are help onboarding them. Uh, some of the conclusions that come up after reading this guidance document is one, uh, as it was mentioned in this presentation, main challenge for adult learners in digital learning is of access. 
accessing a device, accessing the internet, accessing the programs that are used within the classroom. Uh, also, another conclusion, despite challenges from students and staff, we know that digital literacy and digital learning is here to stay. So we see that more and more and more and more programs are have an in-person, a hybrid component, uh, some of the high flex as well. So we know that it's only going to be growing. So knowing that that right there is pretty much here to stay and understanding that there are resources that will help you as an administrator for your agency to be able to, to deliver this type of uh, inst uh, uh, differentiated instruction to your st uh, students. Uh, students also have more control of their education by having greater access to educational opportunities outside of classrooms. So if the student can't come to school because of weather, because of health, or because of work, they know that they could go on to the learning management system, capture and see the work that was done the day they were out. Maybe uh, some agencies upload the videos of the recording. So the student will have access to that information at any time. They're no longer bound to a set time in a brick and mortar setting. Their education now could be in the palm of their hands or as I recommend better on a computer screen. Uh, that way the student has greater opportunities to be successful. And it's also one of the things that the students really appreciate. They really like the fact that if I can't come to class one day and I connect or if I do it virtually or remotely, it'll be the same experience as if I was in the classroom. And that is ultimately what we want. We want to provide our students with opportunities to succeed. And I understand it, is, it can be a challenge for us educators, but with the guidance document, it will provide you a framework of what you can do or maybe of what you are doing now with the tools to help your agency be uh, serve better the students. Uh, so that's the purpose of the guidance document. Again, the guidance document is on the OTAN website. So when you go into the OTAN website, on the upper right hand corner, there will be an area that says the guidance document and it'll take you to a web page where you will have again access to the document, also access to the uh, chapter notes and access to um, conclusions and findings. So I uh, hope that you Take the time to go to the OTAN site and download a copy today. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco, for presenting this OTT. I'd like to encourage viewers at this time to subscribe to OTAN's YouTube channel, where instructional tech videos related to adult education can be found, including OTAN Tech Talks. All of this information and more is available on the OTAN website at www.otan.us. Thank you for watching this OTAN Tech Talk.